to Trapped Under Ice, episode four. We're talking gear. So in this episode, what we're going to touch on is a couple of things to keep in mind when you're fitting your child for new gear, when you're looking at their old gear, uh, stick length, which is a huge hot button topic, and a couple of ways you can identify problems before they become a real issue. So with that being said, we're going to jump into a few things right out of the gates just to clear them off the table. So first one, the gear is your child's responsibility make it their responsibility. They are to maintain it, they are to pack it, they are to take care of it, they are to dry it out after a game or a practice and pack it before a game, things like that. Make them a checklist of everything that needs to be in that bag and make sure they go through it. First couple of times, my suggestion is to spot check them, make sure they do have everything. Keep it all in one area, don't spread it all over the house, that way it's a little bit easier for them. They can get into the routine of it. Uh, make sure that they're the ones that are bringing their gear in, drying it out after game and practice, and then repacking it. This will save you a lot of headaches in the future. Trust me. So that one, right out of the gates, I think is a great idea to empower your child to take care of their own gear. Make it a responsibility of theirs. The next one I also want to touch on, this one is more so for the females. In the beginning of hockey, novice, Adam, all the gear is pretty much the same. It's all pretty much unisex. Minus the, the cup and the jill, it's pretty much all the same. So with that being said, by the time your daughter, stepdaughter, what have you, is stepping into peewee or under 13, they're starting to go through their changes. So with that, it's time to start looking into some female-specific hockey gear. Now, there's only really two pieces that you need to even consider. And one of them is the shoulder pads. This is the big one, right? Is to make sure that you start looking for female-specific shoulder pads or pants. CCM Bauer, a number of companies make them, and they do make a difference. They're designed to fit properly, still provide them the range of motion and protection that they need. Sasha just went through this and just got her first set of female specific shoulder pads. So it was difficult out of the gates because it was something different. And kids don't really like change when it comes down to stuff like that. She found them immediately uncomfortable because they were different. After a couple practices and two or three games, it was fine. She found she had really good movement in them. Uh, they protected her well. They fit comfortably. This was all good things. So look into that. If you have a daughter or a stepdaughter or a niece that's playing hockey, start looking into female specific gear, especially the shoulder pads, as they are coming into Pee Wee or under 13. This is important for the girls. The last piece of information I want to put out on the table right away is mouth guards. By the time a child is into under 13 or the peewee level, they should be wearing a mouthpiece. As somebody who has suffered from concussions in the past due to hockey, this is something that I am a huge advocate for. Mouth guards can minimize concussions, minimize the severity of a concussion, and just protect your teeth. It's all good. They're uncomfortable when you start wearing them. I will admit that I didn't enjoy it. That's probably why I got my concussions that I did. And I have lost teeth in hockey because I've lost my mouth guard or I wasn't wearing my mouth guard. These are things to keep in mind. So it's a good habit to get into just like having the child pack their own gear. A mouth guard is essential when they hit that under 13 level when the game starts getting rougher. So. With those kind of housekeeping things out of the way, we'll start to hit on a couple major things. So hockey gear is pretty simple, right? Shoulder pads, helmet, neck guard, elbow pads, shin guards, pants, right? skates, socks, jersey. That's pretty much Jack or Jill, one or the other. And your stick and gloves. So it's pretty simple. There's a lot of pieces and the pieces don't stand alone. They work as a cohesive unit. 
So it's pieces of armor is the way you need to think about it. And like every suit of armor, there are going to be chinks in it, soft spots, areas that you still can get hurt because the gear is still designed to give you that range of motion and movement. So it can't just be one solid piece. So with that being said, something to think about as your child is growing and moving through the ranks of hockey and hockey is getting rougher, you need to start looking for the gaps. So there's a couple key spots where these gaps start to form. The first one will work from the bottom up. The first spot is between the shin guard and the pants. So that's the pants should overhang your shin guards by about an inch, inch and a half, maybe two inches. As you grow and you don't change your gear, that gap starts to open and you open yourself up to some problems. You can take a shot off the leg, off the top of the thigh. It's not a comfortable situation, right? Take a stick across there, same thing. So what, in that situation, you either need to get a longer shin pad, something that has higher protection, or it might be time to look for a new set of pants that'll hang a little bit lower. The next step is between your shoulder guards and your pants. So in the, if a properly fitted set of pants and shoulder pads should intersect with each other, the shoulder pads should sit inside of the pants by an inch or so on the front and the back. So the front isn't a huge deal, but it can be if you get a butt end or something like that in the guts, that can hurt a lot. So, but a lot of the times, you're actually hunched over in your hockey stance. So that doesn't really matter all that much. The back, on the other hand, as you hunch over, that gap expands. So a lot of shoulder pads now have an extension piece in the back. And that should sit inside the pants. Even when you're leaned over, it should still pretty much cover that entire area up your spine. And as somebody who has taken a cross check across the spine, believe me, this means a lot. So make sure you're watching for these things. And the last one is across the arms. So here we have two chinks in the armor between the glove and the elbow pad and the elbow pad and the shoulder pad. That's where those gaps can start to appear. So at no time have I ever had a solid piece all the way down. What you're looking to do is minimize these gaps. And as your child grows and their arms get longer, those gaps will start to widen. There's a few ways to get around at least the one at the wrist between the glove and the elbow pad. You can get a set of wrist guards. They're basically an athletic uh, wristband with a plastic piece in it to protect you. But these are the spots that you get hit most often with the stick, where you're going to catch it at a spot with no protection. So keep that in mind. And the best way to do this ultimately is to every few months or so, ask your child to put on all their gear, but leave their jersey off, right? Or leave their socks off as well. So you can see the chinks in the armor. You can see where the gaps are starting to form and you can identify what pieces of gear need to be retired and what you need to go out and source out a new set for. So these are the gaps that you need to keep in mind when your child is hitting the ice. The next thing I want to point out is your helmet. Now, I know everybody is trying to save a buck. I know, I know hockey is expensive. It is horrendously expensive. But at the same time, you have to keep your child safe. So people often ask me, can I buy secondhand gear? My answer is, yeah, go ahead and knock yourself out. Right? As long as it's been kept in good condition and it's clean and it doesn't have any cracks or obvious problems, go for it with one exception. And that's the helmet. My suggestion to everybody and the way I explain it to people is would you buy a second hand car seat for your child? No, nobody would, right? You would do everything you can to make sure that you had a new car seat. So you knew the history of it. You knew it was never in an accident. It was never dropped, banged or something like that. Cause you want to keep your child safe. The helmet is the most important piece of protective equipment that your child's going to be wearing. You need to know its history and you need to know that it's been well-maintained. 
most of the time, if somebody asks me if I have a piece of gear that they could have or if they could buy from me that Sasha has grown out of or something like that, it's never a problem. Elbow pads, shoulder pads, like shin guards, whatever, go ahead. Because I know they've been kept in good shape and they're clean. So, absolutely. But the helmet is a no. If the child's just going to be going to recreational skates, okay, fine. Maybe I'll consider it. But if they're playing hockey, high speed, no. No, 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 no. Buy a brand new one. Spend the money. Protect your child. The other point I want to make on helmets is proper fitting. So the helmet should be snug. It should move with your child's head. Your head you shouldn't be able to take the helmet and move it on your child's head. It should sit snug, not tight, because that'll just give them a headache, but snug. And the other side is the chin, the chin guard, where the cage comes down. That chin guard is designed to sit right under the chin, right? So the chin is cupped inside that chin guard. That's how you know the helmet is fitted properly. If it's too low or too high, it does nothing for you. And your child can get easily injured in a way that you wouldn't even have thought of, right? One bump is all it would take. So make sure that chin guard is sitting properly under the chin of your child, and that'll help you out a ton. All helmets can be sized to a certain degree, so make sure you've Open it up all the way. When you get a new helmet, open the flaps on it, size it to its largest size, put it on your child's head, and then shrink it down slowly. Clip it in place once it feels snug and comfortable, but won't move. Those are my suggestions when it comes to a helmet. Elbow, like Everything else is pretty simple. Gloves and elbow pads, as long as they're sitting in the right spots, like the elbow pad is protecting the point of the elbow, your shoulder pads are covering as much as they can. My other suggestion is the neck guards. Get the ones with the bib on them. and Tuck it down inside your shoulder pads. That way it doesn't move. It stays exactly where it's supposed to. And even if it opens in the back, it's not going anywhere. And my last suggestion when it comes down to all this is going to come down to probably the most expensive piece of hockey equipment, the skates. So. When sizing skates, no parent on the face of this planet trusts their kid when they say, yes, a piece of footwear fits or it doesn't fit. We don't trust them. We check. We always do. With skates, it's hard because you can't feel where their toe is. You can't see it. So here's my suggestions when you're getting your child fitted for a set of skates. Right out of the gates. Number one, go someplace reputable. A hockey supplier that you know in your community that they know what they're talking about. Right? They have a good selection, their staff have been there for a while, and they truly know what they're talking about. The second one is, and this goes along with the first one, don't tell the associate your child's size. Have them measure them. They'll break out what's called a Brannock device, and we've all seen this. It's that silver device that sits in shoe stores that no one ever uses. That's a Brannock device, and that is designed to measure a person's foot exactly. Right? There's no wiggle room. What that says you are, that's what you are. Right? It'll measure your width and your instep as well. So utilizing this is important. The reason I know this is I used to sell very high-end backpacking boots. And I wouldn't even ask a customer what their size was or what size they were looking for. I would just measure them. That was our rule. And that way we knew when we fitted them, when they walked out of the store, if they were returned, it wasn't because it was a bad fit. Maybe it was just a faulty boot. But it gave us and the customer that peace of mind. The Brannock device is the keystone in sizing any piece of footwear. So please make sure that the person that's fitting you for skates or fitting your child knows what they're doing. And the last step, after all this is done, if you still want peace of mind that these skates are fitted properly, because you can't see it, you can't tell where the toe is, Pull out the insole. Pull the insole out of the skate, put it on the floor, get your child to step on it, right? Move their heel right to the spot that it should be, and you'll be able to see very quickly how far their toes are from the front of the skate, and if their foot fits inside or if it's spilling over. Maybe they need a wider size. This 
is a very simple thing that can give you peace of mind because nothing is worse than stepping on the ice with a pair of skates that are too loose or too tight. Too tight is painful. Too loose is pretty much just as painful because your ankles are screaming. So you want to get these fitted properly because you know your child's going to be growing fast and things like that. Trust me, I know. I went through three sets of skates in one season. It was not a good time in my house during that. My father was quite pissed. Um, but it wasn't like I could control it. So make sure you're doing these things to ensure that the fit of the skate and the fit of the gear is proper. It will protect your child. All that being said, whose responsibility is it for your child to be properly geared and safe when they step on the ice. Well, we've already discussed making it the responsibility of the child to pack their gear and make sure they have all their pieces. So that's on them. Right? Don't get me wrong, you're still gonna check, but ultimately it's on them. It's your responsibility to make sure the gear is fitting properly. So like I said, have them put on their gear without their jersey and socks and look for those chinks in the armor, look for those gaps so you can adjust and you'll realize you may have to source out a new set of elbow pads or shoulder pads or shin guards or something to make sure that they're safe. And the last line of defense is the coach. The coaches are not going to allow your child on the ice if they're missing a piece of gear, but also if they notice that a piece of gear is not adequately sized or is a potential danger to them, they are not going to let them on the ice. All organizations this is an ironclad rule. This is Hockey Canada, so on and so forth. There is no wiggle room on this. It is black and it is white. That's it. So if a coach notices a piece of gear that is inadequate, they're not going to let your child on the ice. Don't give your coach grief about this. Let them know that you appreciate them looking out for your child because that's all they're doing. They don't. They want the entire team there. You have to make sure that you understand that the coach is there to protect your child as well as teach them. So, and I bring this up because I had this situation before where I had to ask a child to leave the ice due to inadequate gear. They had all their gear on, every piece, but one of the pieces was horribly inadequate. It was far too small. And them being a goalie, I couldn't let them on the ice. It was too dangerous. The Guardians didn't feel that way at first, but after a discussion, they kind of got it. So I felt better in this and I could rest easy knowing that I did the right thing in that moment. And it is a hard thing to tell a child, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, you got all your gear, but I can't let you on the ice because this is inadequate. And having to explain it to parents is about as fun. So with all that being said, these are the biggest things to look at when you're sizing up your child. So if you're brand new to hockey and you don't know all the pieces of gear and how they all go together, ask the questions. Find a coach, another parent, go to that reputable uh, sports store and talk to somebody and let them know when you walk in and be like, look, I know nothing about the gear in hockey. You're going to have to walk me through the whole thing. Most of them will be happy to do it. They'll go from top to bottom and tell you everything that you need to know and probably a bunch of stuff that you don't even care about. But it's important because the knowledge is important to make sure your child is safe. Now, we're going to move on to one of the biggest hot button topics in hockey that I have ever come across. What is the proper length of stick for my child? Okay. Here we go. So I have heard every iteration of this. Well, the stick should be to your collarbone. It should be to your chin, to your lower lip, to your nose, to the middle of your forehead, to the back of your head, whatever. Well, is that on skates or off of skates? How do you know? This is a huge thing for parents when trying to find a proper stick for your child. Now, Stick lengths are basically designed and categorized as short, regular, and long. Right. Short would be from your collarbone to your chin. Medium would be from your chin to the tip of your nose. 
and along from the tip of your nose to the middle of your forehead. And these are all while standing on skates. So, to give you a bit of a better idea on this, a short stick allows for better control of the puck. And the whole idea is a shorter stick forces you to lean forward more. It actually improves your skating because it forces you to get lower. Therefore, you get a longer stride. But it allows you to move your top hand in front of your body. Right? Rather than it bumping against your side because your stick is so bloody long, that it allows you to move your, your top hand in front of your body when stick handling. So a lot of players that we see that utilize like a short stick, Sidney Crosby, Alexander Ovechkin, things like that, Wayne Gretzky used an ex exceptionally short stick. It was so they could move the stick in front of their body and that was important for them, for their stick handling. It also allows for quick wrist shots and things like that. The power transfer is great. So a shorter stick allows for better stick handling, forces you to get lower. The medium stick, the one goes from your chin to the tip of your nose, medium sized stick is kind of the best of both worlds. The longer the stick, the more power you can get on your shot because more whip out of the stick you get. It forces a little bit more difficulty when it comes to stick handling close to the body. So you have to stick handle a little further away to still get that range of motion with your hands. Um, but uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Connor McDavid, these guys utilize the stick. Um, so it is normal for people to utilize this. Um, you look at Connor McDavid or Ryan Nugent Hopkins, these guys got a rocket of a wrist shot. But if you think about, and I use this as I am a huge Oilers fan, and we've all seen highlights of Connor McDavid, his stick handling is obviously incredible. But a lot of the times he's beating defensemen based on speed alone, right? He's getting out past them. So what you have to think of in this situation is a medium length stick or a regular length stick will be a little bit more difficult to stick handle, but you can still do it. You just have to adjust a little bit, right? You have to get a little lower and things like that. So this is a good middle of the road because it allows for both sides. It allows for a good wrist shot, snapshot, and slap shot. It also allows for good stick handling, and it gives you a little bit more reach on poke checks and to keep the puck away from a defender. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. Now, a long stick is ultimately a defenseman stick, right? Defensemen use long sticks because of poke checks and you get so much more power on a slap shot with a longer stick, right? There's so much more whip to it. There's so much more power transfer, things like that. You get an insanely strong slap shot out of a longer stick. You do. That being said, and I want to bring a caveat in here. Having a longer stick doesn't necessarily mean you have a better slap shot. It means you might have more power, doesn't mean it's more accurate. I kind of utilize the idea of swinging a hammer to drive a nail. If you choke up on a hammer when you're trying to hit a nail, you have all kinds of control, but not a lot of power. If you choke down to the end of the handle and you swing it, you have all kinds of power but you have less control. That's kind of the idea of it. So a longer stick, yes, it will provide you more power in your slap shots, but you sacrifice a lot with that. You sacrifice your ability to really stick handle in tight situations and things like that. So just remember that when you're picking out your stick as a defenseman, a longer stick, yes, is definitely beneficial to us, uh, I myself, I used pretty much a regular just into a longer stick. Uh, mine was probably to the bridge of my nose. It was, that was it. And I'm six foot three. So on skates, that's still a pretty long stick. And it took me a while to get used to it. But, uh, so players like Oscar Clefbaum, Zdeno Chara, uh, Nicholas Lidstrom, these guys used these sticks because it gave them an advantage. Right? with poke checks and like picking off a pass and deflecting things, it definitely gave them an advantage. 
the slap shots, obviously with the proper training, they become insanely hard. Shea Weber actually is another one that utilizes an exceptionally long stick. So these are all good things, but what does that mean for your child uh, now that we've run down the list? Well, if your child seems to be fanning on one-timers or missing passes and things like that, because it seems like they're not getting their stick down, the stick is too short. I saw this. I had two or three of them on my team this year where they actually needed a longer stick. Right? If it seems like your child is like almost like can't quite stick handle because they, they're almost fighting with the stick or fighting with themselves, stick is too long. Got to shorten it up a little bit. So my suggestion is a child's stick should land right about at their chin. That's the sweet spot between a short and a regular stick. Somewhere between the chin to the lower lip is probably the best spot as a child is learning to stick handle and things like that. You still get plenty of power. You still get a great opportunity for passing and receiving passes. You still get a good shot away. Your stick handling is great. All of those things. So it allows them to grow and develop all the other skills that they're going to need instead of fighting with the stick that they're using. And they're going to look at their heroes and they're going to want the stick that's the same as them. That's fine. And I get that. Problem is, if you go out and you pull a Sidney Crosby stick off the rack, it's probably going to have a pretty rigid shaft. That being said, is your child even going to be able to bend that stick? Or are you just basically sending them out there with a two by four? These are the things you have to take into account. Can your child bend the stick? Is it far too long for them? Is it far too short for them? And I understand parents, these sticks are atrociously priced right now. $300 for her stick. My dad would have had a heart attack. He almost had a heart attack when I had an Easton stick that cost 80 bucks. Right when the Eastern Aluminums came out and I snapped it in the first game, which, yeah, that was that was rough. Um, but what you have to realize is you don't need to spend three hundred dollars on a stick. You don't. These kids are just learning. These sticks that are three hundred dollars, they make a difference when you've already perfected the skills, and then you're adding to them with the tools that you're using. You don't need to buy these. Right. I guarantee you, your child's wrist shot is not going to change whether they got a $50 stick or a $300 stick. It will not change. And I understand if somehow you come across a $300 stick, maybe it's a present for your child or what have you, you don't want to cut it down because they're going to grow through it. No. Buy them a stick, cut it to the appropriate length. Let them get used to it. Because if you have a longer, if they've had a short stick, the entire time, and then you introduce one that's three inches longer, they're not going to know what to do with themselves. So keep it simple out of the gates. Between the chin and the lower lip, that's the sweet spot somewhere in there that is going to allow them to work a short stick into a regular length. Novice, Adam, Peewee, slap shots aren't really a thing. So having a longer stick doesn't make a lot of sense. And that takes a long time to get used to. So the other way to check for stick length and things like that is have your child on the ice, stand with their hands to their sides, holding the stick at the butt end and keep shortening the stick until the blade lays flat. If the toe of the blade is up off the ice, the stick is too long. And if the, t the heel of the blade is off the ice, the stick is too short. This is another kind of key point. It doesn't really work for defensemen because we tend to use a longer stick. So my suggestion is the between the chin and the lower lip. Somewhere in there gives you that sweet spot that'll work really well as your child is developing all the skills that they need. It's short enough to force them to get low. They can still get a wrist shot away. Their passes will be good. They'll have good control of the puck. It still gives them that opportunity to stick handle, but it's long enough that gives them that poke check opportunity and then get those snapshot and slap shots away. So this is my personal preference and my personal thoughts on the whole thing. And I really wanted to bring that forward. So side note, guys, um, recently Alicia actually 
went online and found a brand called Nomad Hockey out of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. She bought me a couple of their pieces. They are fantastic. These guys do great work. I've checked them out online. Um, I got stickers and a postcard and all kinds of stuff that came in the package. Uh, these guys do great work. So please check them out. I'll put them in the description below. Uh, these guys are fantastic. So quick shout out to another Nova Scotian that's out there doing the great things for hockey. Um, check out their gear. It's awesome. Their hats are great too. So guys, when it comes down to gear, just to kind of wrap the whole thing up in a nice little bow is it's constantly changing. There's new technology always coming out, but keep it simple, right? Your number one point of all the gear is to keep your child safe. So start looking for the chinks in the armor. Just make sure the sizing is appropriate. Ask the questions that you need to ask in order to make sure your child's going to be safe, that they're going to be mobile so they'll be able to compete and get better, but also that it's going to cover where it needs to cover and that it's going to keep them safe. Make them responsible for their gear. Get them into a mouthpiece or a mouth guard by the time they hit the peewee or under 13 levels. And understand that if the child doesn't have a piece of gear or a piece of gear is inadequate and the coach doesn't let them on the ice, that's not the coach being a jerk. They're looking out for your kid. They want to make sure that they're okay and safe when they step on the ice. But aside from all that, guys...